One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-host S with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? You know what? I'm fantastic. God for it. You know? Yeah. I'll yeah. say it. Uh I uh I I, I pulled a, a 14 hour podcast day yesterday. Woof. Uh, for like notes, uh, getting my notes in order for, for this and for Patreon and such. Uh, and so today I was like, cause I gotta be ready for today. Right. Um, and then I had to like, I mean, of course I also in there uh, dealt with laundry and dishes and stuff like that, but it, it was a very long day. And then I was going to go to bed and I was like, shit, I need to do groceries tomorrow. So I have to quickly make and do all these things tonight. So I was up very late. And then didn't sleep in because my brain just is a bitch, I guess. Um, but uh, tonight, I was like, you know what? We're uh, we're going to record a little later than usual. Uh, thank you very much, time change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. Very much pop. Yeah, my favorite. Uh, my favorite thing from that movie. Um, but uh, I was like, you know what? We're, we're probably not going to record for a couple of hours. God, I have so many things I should probably do, but I was like, you know what? You've earned just, just maybe like chilling out. Yes. So I, so I had a shower, got myself very cozy and I put on the new Lindsay Lohan Christmas movie. How is it? I'm not going to give spoilers. Great. I will say this. One, it appears as though people online are trying to review the movie as though it's like a cinematic release to theaters, Mean Girls 2 sort of situation. They're like, mm -hmm. we've got to rate it because it's an Oscar contender. It's like, first of all, slow down. It's a Christmas movie and Christmas movies have a very different uh, Christmas movies are just so different than, you know, a movie that someone would put in like a, a festival or something like that. So it's like, you gotta look at it from a different angle. Um, and I think overall, I think it was good. I have seen so much worse, so oh. much worse, but, um, overall I was charmed by it and I'm going to be so bold as to make this statement. I can't wait. Three words. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna add a fourth word. Four Please. words. Lohan is back, baby. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I was, I was charmed by her the whole time I felt I was getting emotional because I'm just so proud of her and where she's come. Hey. So I think it was great. And I hope. That she continues going this rate. I hope that eventually she maybe gets back to doing the Mean Girls types of things that people are hoping from her. The ones that you can review Siskel yep. and Ebert style. Family Christmas movies is a whole other thing. It's a it's a different. They're different. Um, but I, I I thought it was good. I was I was impressed. It was a good first one out the gate because I had not watched one yet this season. And uh, I was going to save it for my birthday, but I was like, no, I I want to get in it because I just, I, I need something, something nice and light, get me in there. And what did I do while I watched it? Well, I put together a Lego wreath. So I had a very festive evening. <laughs> Holy shitter. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Um, it's listen. cute. I will say, and I've talked about this on the show, I think, before, as yeah. someone who was a featured actor in a little picture called Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. Yes. Um, which at the time was making history for being a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And people were like, oh, <laughs> I was like, it enraged me sure. for so many reasons. First of all, there is so many moments in that movie that made me genuinely laugh out loud. And I'm a tough critic. But here's why. Yeah. Because I turned off the 
impossible critic. Oh God. Yeah. Not everything. Not everything is Schindler's list. This is what I've been saying recently. Not, yeah. and nor does it need to be. There is no. so, so much art that is so valid and wonderful and makes people feel happy and gives them a laugh or a, or a heartwarming feeling. And that, are, that is just as valid as the high drama Oscar, in my opinion, Oscar movies. It is just as valid. They all serve a purpose because I don't need to tell you when you're tonight, you didn't think to yourself, Ooh, I have this time. I'd like to sit down with something really heavy and, and that's going to make me really think about the human yeah. condition. No, you thought I would like to say, I would like to watch something light that is holiday themed. I'd like to kick. And so again, it's like, it's like, there's, to me, it's like this whole argument is, is, is suggesting that there's only one type of film that's relevant. And I just sure. get my back up about it because it's like, that's suggesting that we only have one setting as humans and we don't. There's no. so many different ways that people enjoy. And I'll say it need to be entertained. Yes. Sometimes it's really smart comedy. Sometimes it's really dumb comedy. Sometimes it's a nice romance. Sometimes it's something heavy, hard hitting, Oscar winning, sure. whatever. But all of them are valid. There is nothing that is better than anything else, in my opinion. It just all is. And yes. uh, I I love this. I love that Lohan is back. I love that yes. she made her come back in a Christmas movie. I think that's oh, yeah. wonderful and lovely. And again, it doesn't have to be more than it is no because also i don't think that anybody who's watching is is going this is gonna win some oscars we right? all know we all know the difference yes why do we have to then sit and write out all the reasons publicly what uh, th that it's not yeah. you know what i'm saying like no one yeah. needs to point out that it's not an oscar movie but to me it's like it has just as much validity in terms of the scope of entertainment and it just, I'll get off my soapbox now, but it is one of my biggest pet peeves, again, yeah. is the suggestion that something is more valid than something else. When again, to me, the gift of art is that you can have it all. That's the whole point. Yes. The whole point of movies, I'm going to say it, is to entertain. Exactly. And for me... In the months of November and December, the way I would like to be entertained, I'd like to see um, some snow. I don't like living in it, but it's where I live. Um, I want to see some beautiful snow. I I want to see a couple that maybe have like a little like uh, at the beginning, but you feel that they're softening, and then eventually yep. you want it. Eventually, yep. there's the love. Um, I I, I want to see magic i want to see uh i want to see an old guy that you're like who's that guy and it's like Psst, he's santa you know like i want i want that kind of thing to come out the mall santa that turns out to be the real santa one of my favorite things i just that's what i want i want light i don't care if it's predictable i want something that makes me feel light and happy because it's nice and it's whimsical and that's what i love about it and so Absolutely. i think it was a great one right out the gate um and yeah i think i'm just in christmas movies now i think that's what i've done um so warning to my husband that my choices from now on on our movie nights probably gonna be a tad on the festive side so. I love to see you. I love it. It's yeah. uh you know, again, I feel like in a in a world in a world where everything feels overwhelming and yes. like it's all going to shit. Yeah. The one thing you can control is your own festive spirit. You know what I mean? And look, I will say, it's not 24 7 christmas not yet it will be yeah. but uh last night uh while i was uh working on things it was my movie pick i picked ticket to paradise 
the oh. uh, George Clooney, Julia Roberts rom com. What is that? What? A fucking delight. Oh, I can't wait. Clooney? I'm writing like, it down. I'm, I'm not kidding. At least eight times in that movie, I would turn to my husband and go, oh, this is classic Clooney. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you love that. I'm like, I do. I do. He was so charming. Like the entire time I said multiple times throughout it, they had so much fun making this movie. Like you can feel it. And the, the chemistry between them is amazing. And I just thought, let's get fucking rom-coms back because I know they try not to, and they've like kind of gone away, but I, yeah. Bring us the classic rom-coms. I love it. Oh, I thought it was, I, I, again, I was charmed by it. Clooney, I mean, good God, that man. It was the, it's the character he's born to play is just, he's so sarcastic and yes, I, I live for it. And it's just really hot, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I look, we, we had some chuckles and uh, yeah. Give me a rom-com. That's what I'm, I'm also, uh, I will also accept a uh, disaster movie, preferably with a love story in there somewhere. It doesn't have yeah. to be the main story, but it has to be one of them. Um, of or some sort of uh, action comedy adventure. Or <laughs> not to, not to be nitpicky, but you know. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Yeah. I get it. I fully get it. And I, I like it. a cinematic adventure. <laughs> <laughs> it's the earnest level. I like a yeah. cinematic adventure. I, uh, do. I do. I get that. And, and soon for the rest of the year, probably from here on out for me, it's, uh, it's going to get festive as hell over here. And I can't wait because they make it. me feel good. And why wouldn't I? Yeah. Why wouldn't Who you? Who am I hurting? My husband. He's fine. He'll get over it. He's a big kid. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. A couple of quick pieces of business. Yeah. I just want to take a quick moment because sure. we lost another person this week. And that person, of right. course, was Aaron Carter. Right. Yeah. Which, of course, we did talk about in the... Help me out. Lou Perlman. Thank you very much. Yeah. We talked about him in that episode. Yeah. Um, What a tragedy. So young. So young and, yeah. you know, I'm about to make a comment that's going to sound like I'm being funny and I'm truly not. Sure. But I was very into his season of marriage. It was marriage boot camp, but it was family boot camp, his season. Interesting. Um, okay. And he went on with his mom and I feel like he was so open and so vulnerable in terms of his life experience and and it was heartbreaking to watch at times and i know that there's been you know there's there's a lot that's gone on with him over the years a hundred percent um lots of nuance is my point sure. um in in his journey which i'm not glossing over however uh it was very sad i was very sad when i when I heard this, I was like, that feels to me like someone much along the lines of when we talk about our, our blanket gals on this show and stuff like that, it feels like someone who was very lost and was very kind yeah. of um, lost by the people that should have been there for him uh, and weren't. And I'm not suggesting he was a perfect person. Um by any stretch, I, again, I know there was a, a lot of dynamic, again, and nuance and whatnot, um, but very sad to hear. Very sad yes. to hear. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, I have great compassion anytime you hear of anyone who becomes very famous as a child. Mm -hmm. I have great compassion when, uh, again, there is lots of information pointing towards him maybe not having a great experience as a child sure um 
but you know, again, I, I had to, had to bring it up because it felt like that was again, not only co connected to the pop culture world, which you and I are obviously very invested in, yes, but also connected to an episode that we had done. And, um, we, uh, again, it was, uh, it was just a very sad, sad thing to, to learn for me. Yes. Yeah. It just feels like he never really, I, I mean, of course I did not know him personally, but it feels like those around him maybe weren't as supportive as maybe they should have been, but yeah. Well, yeah. And, you know, um, he brought in a lot of money for the, he was a huge star, huge yeah. star, you know, back in, I would say the 2000s, the early 2000s, he was a big star. And yeah. um, again, when you hear him speak in different interviews and stuff like that, it feels like it's like, there's just so much pain there. Uh, there's so much hurt, all of those kinds of things. And it's just very sad. It feels very sad. Someone who feels like a troubled person um, that was kind of not necessarily set up to succeed, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um. So yeah, shout out, uh, shout out there because again, it feels the whole thing again, um, the whole star system is just built to destroy yeah these children we've seen yeah. it so many times it's very sad uh there is one other thing i need to very quickly address sure and this is up to the moment up to the moment yeah chris evans was given sexiest man of the year by people magazine this week he was and i have a couple of things to say Sure. One, I thank you to everyone who tagged me in it. There was thousands of you. Bless you. I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. Some people were critical of his photos. Really? And I said, get out of town. Go take a bus. Go take a bus to the, to the country and, and buy some jams. Because that's something else. <laughs> that's something else going on there. It's hot go, as hell. Come on. Go take a bus out of town and go buy some jams. It's probably now my favorite thing you've ever said. I can't wait for next week's promo because I think I know what it might be. <laughs> I feel like uh, I'm just challenging myself every episode now. Like, is this the sound bite she's gonna choose? Um look, I'll tell you this. Yeah, you uh you never disappoint. God bless. I, it's it's difficult to narrow down to the three well but, bless it out yeah. but uh, again i was like that's silliness that's silly he looks good he looked fucking great he looked great <laughs> as she pours herself another sloppy glass of wine i've also worked for an exceedingly long amount of hours today so it's gonna get sloppy in here and i feel no shame anyway but promo today, two thank you Today, there was an additional announcement that came out, which is that he has been dating someone for over a year. Yeah. Here's the thing. Anyone who has listened to this show for, I'd say maybe the last year? I feel like the last year, probably. I feel like I amped it up a year ago. Anyone who's listened to this show for the last year knows my love of Chris Evans. Yes. It's a true and pure love. And to that, I want to address this because I would like to um, not be tagged in the things online about it anymore. <laughs> Here's what it is. I wish him the best. Ultimately, there's nothing I want for Chrissy Evs more than happiness. Yeah. And if he is finding that with his much younger girlfriend, I welcome that for him. I hope that they have a very wonderful, deep mental and emotional connection. Sure. Um, 
but I think, you know, a big, a big thing for me is just that it feels interesting that they have allegedly, allegedly been dating for over a year. And he made that hmm. big plea, whatever it was like four months ago, where he's like, I really want to settle down. I really want to find the one. And it's like, but if you've been dating her for a year. How does she feel about that speech? My question was, was that him communicating to her? It's on green light. You know what I mean? We may never know yeah. the truth. It's none of our business, but it just is our business because I have made the choice to speak about him so many times and yeah. ultimately, mm -hmm. again, getting tagged in a lot of stuff. Getting tagged in a lot of stuff. So uh, I do believe it started uh, during the Blanche Furrens. It did. Because prior to that, you did not really Ever. mention celebrities. Ever. In that way. Ever. And then after that, it was like, look out. Here I come. And if you think I know what episode that was, I mean, it was the, the Ed and Lorraine Warren. But I don't remember for the life of me what, when we did that episode. If you told me we did that yesterday, I'd go, I guess. Like, yeah, well, I think it was sometime this year, wasn't it? Oh, God, I want to say know. yes. I want to say yes. I mean, I'm going to need to take a quick pause. Yeah. I think Sharky is outside the house. <laughs> All right, let's let's give a clap real quick. Yeah. One, two, three. Uh, so sorry about that, dear listeners. I just was hearing. Um, escalating very plaintive meows uh i thought that sharky had maybe gotten out turns out he was just trapped in a spare bedroom with the door closed but uh, good news he's here he's fine uh and listen maybe that's the universe telling me stop ragging on chris evans maybe he's very happy and i hope that i'd love to see that for him i hope that for him i really do i just want to know what they talk about Oh, dying to be a fly on the wall there. Just to just to hear we don't know a, a conversation about things. We don't know. Um, I will say that brief pause did give me a chance to look up. It was episode seventy two. Thank you. Um, which came out February twenty second, and I find that fascinating that the Blanche Furance episode happened the month of your birth. Yeah. But the date of mine. Great point. Isn't that weird? It is. And I've taken this opportunity to just double check the ages involved. And Chrissy Elves is 41 and his girlfriend wow. is, of course, 25. It's fine. It's fine. But, you know, just again, it... <laughs> I, I just want to see a small list no no in this case it can't be a list i'm gonna need to see a venn diagram of your likes and dislikes <laughs> yeah that's all i need yeah. to see i need to see what uh what's in that center what uh what overlaps there i'm just curious i'm not saying that you can't have a large age difference and of course and be perfectly happy uh, case in point, Cher seems very happy with her boyfriend, with who is 40 years younger than her. Amber Rose's ex, uh, apparently. Huh. Yeah. Good for you, Cher. Good for you, Cher. But again, what do they talk about? <laughs> it feels wild. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. They just I don't know. watch Moonstruck <laughs> and then snap out of it. She, uh, that's she my, like that's the only nine, line I remember from Moonstruck. I like that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I guess what we're learning is that maybe it's possible to have a successful relationship with someone that you have uh, no common ground with, nothing in common with, and you know, no uh, easy kind of shared reference level to pull from. Sure, that was a bit, but also like. There's probably some truth to that. Hey, 25 and 41. I just, I, I expected more from him. There 
I said it. Yeah. I said it. Wow. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, and I want to make it clear this is not me disparaging age gap relationships in no. general. In general, if you were outside of Hollywood and you were in an age gap relationship, that may be a very different situation. But in Hollywood, it's just such a cliche all the time. Right? And I just really thought, I was like, I think that he's bigger than that i was like i think that he wants something that has like and listen maybe it has extreme depth maybe their relationship has extreme depth sure do we think that i think we left it long enough there could have been crickets a cricket sound we on did. our soundboard <laughs> <laughs> we really need to get that soundboard but yep. you know what i mean like it's just just, just curious you know, again, Hollywood is just such a weird thing. But hey, look, if they're happy, great. Look, I will never understand most Hollywood like situations. Yep. Like, for the love of God, I'm never going to understand what's going on with Nick Cannon. It's getting to a point now that it's like, is anyone going to step in? Is anyone going to talk to him? Like, is anyone at all going to think about saying something? Yeah. Um, the thing for me, I understand that some people want to just keep having kids and keep having kids and all of that sort of thing. And good for you. Yeah. Um, the, the thing for me is that in the last... 17 months. Yeah. He has either had or has announced that a woman is pregnant with seven children. Wow. And if you're like, that can't be right. I uh, direct you to this diagram that I've made. Diagram? So, these these are the children. That Nick Cannon has had starting in April 2011. He had twins, uh, yes. Monroe and Moroccan, with Mariah Carey. Then February 2017, he had Golden Sagan with mm -hmm. Brittany Bell. Kid number four is Powerful Queen in December 2020. And December 2020, then we're getting into 2021. And of that course. is where we're going. So... After child number four, we jump down to the twins, five and six, Zion and Zillionaire in June 2021. Then, where are we going for there? Uh, seven at the bottom was Zen in June 23rd, nine days later, mm -hmm. with uh, someone else. Mm -hmm. Kid number eight, Legendary Love in January 2022. Nine was Onyx Ice in September 2022. Then we go back up to Rise Messiah. Ten days later, sorry, nine days later. Isn't that a fun pattern again? Mm. Uh, and since Rise in September of this year, then it was announced November 3rd that he's having another, a second baby with Alyssa Scott. And then... Six days later, it was announced he's having a third child with uh, Addie De La Rosa. And I'm going to tell you the fun I had making this. Uh, what a delight. What a delight. But I, it's just, uh, have, have the kids. Have however many kids you want to have. This just feels like, that's a lot in a small span. How well, much are you seeing them all? Yeah, uh, what's happening there? And then I was like, what's going on? Um, I had forgotten the age gap between Nick Cannon and Mariah Carey. Right. Because uh, they met when she was 35 and he was 24. That's right. And they, I also forgot they renewed their wedding vows every year on their anniversary. And he got that back tattoo. Oh boy. Um, 
I also don't think I realized that Monroe was like after Marilyn Monroe and Moroccan was after the Ram Moroccan inspired decor in her apartment in New York, which felt like a choice, but it is what it is. Uh, they separated in 2014 after six years of marriage. I also like that they denied being together um, in April 2008 and then got married <laughs> like within a month of publicly denying that they were together. And apparently they had only been dating for a couple of months when they officially got married. Right. But then I ended up down a rabbit hole. Of course. For Mariah Carey. Because I didn't know when they when they separated. Well, I guess technically it was, oh yeah, when they separated. Um, she started dating 47-year-old Australian billionaire James Packer. That's right. Uh, Mariah was 44 at the time. They went public in June 2015, announced an engagement in January 2016, and then split in October of 2016. Uh, Mariah released a memoir. James Packer is not mentioned in it at all. Mariah said, and I quote, if it was a relationship that mattered, it's in the book. If not, it didn't occur. Wowzer. He okay. has also publicly said their relationship was never physical. Oh, come on. Eh, but they ended up splitting up. And then 46-year-old Mariah started dating her 33-year-old backup dancer, Brian Tanaka, in mm -hmm. late 2016. They broke up in April 2017, but then got back together soon after. And it seems as though they have just remained together ever since. Which, 46 and 33. On one hand, yeah. good for her. On the other hand, what do you talk about? What are you talking I have, about? I do have a lot of a lot of questions um about that. Again, outside of Hollywood, I'm sure it's a lot easier to uh have an age difference of that size or larger. Yeah. In Hollywood specifically, it feels it feels interesting. But yeah. Uh, it's it's the seven kids in the span of 17 months that it's well he had said something about how he has some chronic illness right and then he was like i want to have as many kids as i can while i can right i only remember him being like i think it's time for a vasectomy and I then within a week it about... was like oh yeah by the way she is pregnant so i'm gonna hold off on that I think there was something about him having a chronic illness and that part of it was that he was like, um, lupus, here we go. Quick Google. Um, that it was basically like he was diagnosed with lupus 10 years ago. This was from, from, from this year. And oh. I had read an article where he was basically like, well, I just want to like have as many kids as I can as while I can. But the, but the problem that I have with that is that it's like so you're having all of these children that sure hopefully you can financially support because i'm assuming that you're bringing in the money or that you have money sure. saved but it's odd to me to to say like i want to have as many children as possible when i'm declining in health that's not sure. that's not a that's not a People are going to come for me and I don't fucking care. It's a selfish choice. Sure. Because in my opinion, if you are having seven children in 17 months and you feel, and I am basing this on the article I read, maybe his diagnosis has changed since then. If so, I apologize. But given the fact that I remember reading that he was saying that it's like, well, I have this chronic illness and I feel like I'm, you know, going to be declining quicker in life than other people. So I want to have as many children as I can. Prior to that, sure. it's like for you or for them? Because that sounds to me like it is for you. Yeah. 
you know? Yeah, it's just, and you know what? I don't know what he's like as a parent. He could be the greatest dad in the world. And sure. I I really hope he is. I don't know one way or the other. I just, how much do you see them? That well, just feels my, like yeah. so many. God, well, that's even, my point is that it's like, it's all well and fine to have the money for 12 plus children. But do you spend time with them? And again, if if using, again, what I believe I read as his whole thing was like, I feel like my life will be shorter than others. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I would look at that and go, I don't know that I would want to put a child through that. Yeah, I just, I mean, I feel part of it is potentially um, he did sadly lose one of the children. Yes. As, at quite a young age. And so I don't know if it's one of those, like, was that the teaching moment of life is short, just go for it? Maybe. It's just, it's a, it's a lot, a, a lot. Yeah. I, when I, when I met my husband, I was pretty convinced I wanted four. Um, and when he met me, he was pretty convinced he wanted two. Um, we, when we got engaged, we made sure we were having discussions on what are each of our expectations regarding future children, because we didn't want to get far down the road and then end up, that was a big problem. Of course. Um, and then we agreed, okay, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll go one more than he's comfortable with and one less than I was hoping. So we'll just, we'll go with three. Cause that felt like a compromise. Uh, when that third child was ripped out of my body i said never again <laughs> i i oh i can't i can't imagine i uh, i mean i i love my kids to death i just could not imagine another one of them um like i'd have a i'd have a toddler right now and wowza wowza this show is my fourth child and I'm good. <laughs> yeah. You know, for both of us, we share it. We birthed it together. We did. It was yep. ripped out of our bodies. Yep. Hard. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a. I was proud it, to be your, your doula and I was happy that you were my midwife. Yeah. Oh, I like how that works. Absolutely. I like it. And a uh, natural birth. In that, of course. In that respect. Well, listen, ripped us a new one. Thank you very much. <laughs> we should, on that note, we should really get into the episode. Yeah. We're, of yeah, course, yeah. talking the new Unsolved Mysteries episode, Body in the Bay. Uh, if you've not watched it yet, never fret, because we're going to give you a quick synopsis right now. In January 2013, Patrick Mullins went to test the motor in his boat when he disappeared. The following day, his boat was found abandoned miles away. Then, nine days later, Patrick's body was found floating face down, tied to an anchor. He had been shot in the head. Police believe that the wound was self-inflicted. But if that's true, then why was there no sign of blood in the boat? And where did the gun come from? And if Patrick was murdered, then who was responsible? Was Patrick in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or did someone he know take his life? Join us, dear listeners, as Christy takes us through the case of Patrick Mullins, including the evidence that was collected and the evidence that was not. It's an episode full of back-to-back -back true crime, all set in the sunshine state. Don't miss it. I don't, I don't know why I essentially wrote a commercial. I loved it. That's where we're at. That was my... Yesterday was a particularly long day um, trying to get these notes done. <laughs> and this morning, I had been up very late. I was up early. And this morning, I was like, oh, I need to write that synopsis before I go and get groceries because then the day is going to get away from me. And you'll be like, I'm ready to record. And I'll be like, oh, shit, I have to do that yet. So uh, that's what came out. You never know what you're going to get. I loved it. But I loved it. 
I will say there is a lot of true crime packed into this episode. So nonstop, nonstop. Uh, Disclaimer, as always, this episode will contain mentions of suicide and substance abuse. So trigger warning for those who need it. Patrick Lee Mullins was born October 20th, 1960 in Tallahassee, Florida to Albert Wilson and Nancy Jean Hooten. At some point, Albert and Jean separated and Jean married Patrick Mullins. Uh, no, it's, I, I realize now it, it, it's fine. It's just, I realize how that sounded. Patrick Mullins was born and then his mother married Patrick Mullins. Completely other Patrick Mullins, obviously. Right. Uh, in 1963, the family moved to Manatee County, where Patrick grew up on Anna Marina Island. Anna Maria, sorry, Island. The Mullins family included five children, although I'm not sure on the birth year for most of them. From what I can best tell, it seems like Patrick was the third child. The other siblings included Linda, Bert, Gray, and Nancy. Patrick graduated from Manatee High School and attended the University of Florida, where in the late 70s or early 80s, Patrick was introduced to Leslie Jill, who went by Jill, uh, who was the roommate of Patrick's brother's girlfriend at the time. Patrick and Jill hit it off and were married on June 18th, 1983. They settled down in Bradenton, Florida, and later had two sons, Mason McCaffrey in 1987 and Miles Patrick around 1989. Patrick was a sergeant in the National Guard. He helped survivors of Hurricane Andrew in 1992. He also worked as a teacher for over 20 years at William H. Bashaw and Jesse P. Miller Elementary Schools before attending the University of South Florida, where he earned a master's degree. In 2004, Patrick became a librarian or media specialist at Pal- Palmetto High School. Jill uh, was a librarian at Lakewood Ranch. And I should point out, at the time when Patrick went back to university to get his master's degree, Jill did the same thing. Which I think is very sweet, them going back to school together. So, Patrick believed in the power of an education. He was a member of the Manatee Association for Media Education, the Manatee Education Association, and the Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society. He was also an avid gardener and fisherman, an experienced boater, who was part of the Florida chapter of the Antique Outboard Motor Club. Which brings us to the date in question. Sunday, January 27th, 2013. Jill recalls that it was a beautiful day. She made a trip to her aunt's house in Sarasota to look through family memorabilia as her mother had passed away three months prior. Jill planned to be back by early afternoon as she had a co-worker coming by later to pick up some old furniture. Patrick told Jill that he'd help her with the furniture when she returned. Jill left home around 11.30 a.m., She last had contact with Patrick around 1 p.m. A few things to add to this timeline that got found out later during the course of the investigation. A receipt was found to show that Patrick purchased a boat fuel filter and two cycle oil at 1.52 p.m. Patrick then installed the new filter on his son's boat before taking out his own boat. When Jill arrived home around 6 p.m., Patrick wasn't there. His truck was in the driveway, but their 14-foot stump knocker boat was missing from the dock in the backyard. According to a neighbor, Patrick was seen in his boat between 3 and 4 p.m. And later, a store clerk claimed to have seen Patrick between 2 and 4 p.m. They said that Patrick came into the store alone. It was not said uh, what, if anything, Patrick may have purchased. Jill started calling around to ask any if anyone had seen Patrick. Patrick allegedly told his brother and a friend that he was taking the boat out to test the motor. But since the boat's navigation lights weren't working, it was unlikely that Patrick would stay out after dark. And on that particular day, the sun set in Bradenton at 6.07 p.m. 
The Mullins House was located on the Braden River, which connects to the larger Manatee River. I will post a photo on our socials at True Crime and Cocktails on Instagram and Facebook and at Not Detectives on Twitter, should Twitter still exist at that time. <laughs> uh, Jill believed that Patrick would stick to the Braden River as the stump knocker was meant for more shallow waters. And in the past, Patrick had preferred to stay within the confines of the Braden River. When Patrick hadn't returned home before dark, Jill was concerned, but she believed that Patrick would make his way home eventually, because even if something had happened to the boat since he was testing the motor, maybe there was a problem with the motor, uh, Patrick was an excellent swimmer. But when Patrick still hadn't returned by 11 p.m., Jill called the Manatee County Sheriff's Office and a missing persons report was filed at 11.46 p.m. The Coast Guard was then notified at 2.40 a.m. According to the Coast Guard, they were searching for a man who was last seen wearing blue jeans, a t-shirt, and a straw hat. Despite using an MH-60 Jayhawk chopper, a plane, a 45-foot response boat, and two smaller boats, their searches came up empty. An Egmont State Park ranger took a ride around the island, which is located off the Manatee River in the mouth of Tampa Bay. The ranger reported seeing nothing of note and no one appearing to be in distress. She said there were enough people in the area and boats as well that someone in distress would have been noticed. After Patrick's disappearance was mentioned in the Bradenton newspaper, a witness reported to the Coast Guard that they had seen Patrick's boat around 6 or 6.15 p.m. departing the Terra Sea Bay and heading west at 15 knots. The witness was on a boat with two friends taking pictures when they saw a boat that matched the pictures that had been printed in the newspaper. The boat's green bimini top was up and one person was on board, heading west towards Passage Key at 15 to 20 miles per hour. The boat was far enough away that the witness could not provide a description of the person on the boat, but did say that there was clearly only one person on the boat at the time. The Coast Guard sent photos of Patrick's boat to the witness, and they confirmed that Patrick's boat was in fact the vessel that they saw on January 27th. The witness also claimed to have seen a total of three boats departing that area at the time, but didn't know the boat owners. The day after Patrick went missing, the crew aboard a Tampa Bay shuttle boat located Patrick's boat around 11 a.m. The stump knocker was found near Egmont Key Channel by the marker buoys 9 and 10 about nine miles or 14 kilometers west of Egmont Key. The Coast Guard was notified and Jill was contacted at 11.09 a.m. Jill was emailed photos of the boat and at 12.12 p.m. Jill was able to verify the boat did in fact belong to Patrick. The boat's green bimini top was down and secured. The engine was set to neutral the throttle was in the idle position, and the boat had run out of gas. The boat contained two five-gallon gas tanks. One was full, one was empty, and two different personal flotation devices. There were also two paddles, a boat battery, a Phillips head screwdriver, a telescopic boat hook, a dock line, and two water bottles. Patrick's straw hat and Costa del... Del Mar sunglasses were also found on the boat, but no one was on board and the anchor was missing. There was no blood on the boat, which was confirmed with a luminol test, so investigators didn't suspect foul play. After taking photos, the Coast Guard had to decide how to bring the boat to dry land. The trailer eye bolt was rusted, it wiggled quite a lot when they touched it and so they believed that it wouldn't hold up to being towed they believed the only option to bring the boat in was to use the boat's extra five gallons of gas to fill the tank and then have one of the coast guard crewmen operate the vessel uh, they got permission from their station 
And at 3.37 p.m., a member of the Coast Guard drove the boat back to a dock. The Coast Guard crew estimated that the boat likely drifted from the Manatee River area. The search for Patrick grew larger. There was the Sheriff's Office Marine Unit and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission joining the searches. Patrick was still nowhere to be found. Jill later said, quote, I wished he'd be found alive, but really prayed he would simply be found because an answer is at least an answer. Then on February 5th, nine days after Patrick went missing, his body was found. Floating face down about half a mile off Sneeds Island at Emerson Point. Sneeds Island is equidistant between the entrances of Terracia Bay and the Manatee River. And to clarify, Emerson Point, where the boat was found, is approximately 10 miles or 16 kilometers east of Egmont State Park. Um, and for those watching the video, I've, I, I know I've said a lot of places and it sounds confusing. I've got a map, but again, I will, I will post on socials um, for those who are just uh, listening. And again, it's a crude map, so be, be kind. So just to give us the idea, the Mullins house was down uh, kind of south off of the Braden River. Braden River comes up, meets up with the Manatee River. His body was found approximately there at the Emerson Point. And then way, way over here would have been the boat. So it just feels like that's a long way for the, the boat and the body to be completely separate. I'm just saying. And look, crude, but still not bad. Anyhow. Well done. Very well Thank done. Thank you. Thank you. I don't need praise, but I don't hate it. Thank you. So Patrick was fully dressed, but his right shoe was missing. There was rope knotted around his body. It was wrapped vertically twice over his shoulder and between his legs, and then wrapped around his waist six times. The rope was attached to the 25-pound anchor, which had been missing from Patrick's boat. There was just enough slack in the rope to allow Patrick's body to float to the surface. The water in that area was approximately four feet deep. Patrick suffered a shotgun wound to the right side of the, of the head. He was positively identified via fingerprints compared to the prints in his military record. Patrick Mullins was 52 at the time of his death. He was described as smart, cautious, wonderful, and by the book. He had a wry sense of humor and really enjoyed helping people. The autopsy was conducted by the District 12 medical examiner, Dr. Russell Vega. And if that name sounds familiar to any of you true crime buffs, it's because Dr. Vega was the medical examiner on another well-known case in Florida. So before we get into the autopsy findings, we're going on a previously Previous Dr. Russell Vega case, side note. John Wells was last seen around 11.30 a.m. on July 8, 2003 in Arcadia, Florida. When John hadn't re returned home by 11.30 p.m., his family and friends started combing the area looking for him. John's grandmother, Pat Strader, later called police to report John missing. Hours later, John's body was found floating in a watery ditch in Joshua Creek, about five miles or 8.4 kilometers from Arcadia. John's vehicle was located nearby. John Wells was just 17 at the time of his death. He was described as brilliant, kind-hearted, and always willing to lend a hand. And while pol police were informed of John's death, they weren't able to start an investigation until almost 24 hours after John was reported missing. Unfortunately, by then, the crime scene had been contaminated and the police had very little to go by. Upon first inspection, investigators believed that John slipped into the water by accident, hit his head on a piece of metal, and drowned. But an autopsy performed by Dr. Vega determined that John had been shot in the head. Unfortunately, 
this didn't help to speed investigation at all, since there were no eyewitnesses or any decent leads to follow. Police then learned that John's grandmother, Pat, who was one of the three people who found John's body, had removed pieces of evidence from the scene before police arrived. Pat, of course, denies this. Pat and John lived together, and for the most part, their relationship seemed amicable. However, some have suggested they that their relationship went south after the death of Pat's husband. Police also looked into Pat's stepson, Skip, and John's friend, Patrick Skimmer, Skinner, sorry, as John and Skip had allegedly argued in the days leading up to John's death. And it turns out that John was meant to inherit his grandfather's sawmill, but somehow Skip kind of got in there first to make it so he would get it. I don't really get it, but police said that it was just a dead end, so they didn't bother uh, continuing looking into Skip. Skinner admitted publicly to finding a loaded gun near John's vehicle where John's body was found, although this information and the weapon itself were never given to police. And if that's not sketchy enough, Pat, Skip, and Skinner were the three people who found John's body. In 2006, a woman approached the police to say that her boyfriend, 19-year-old Kevin Callahan, had told her that he had a handgun that would match the bullet John was shot with. It appears as though that lead was never followed up on. In 2017, a second forensic pathologist prepared an autopsy report claiming the gun fell out of John's holster when he got out of the vehicle. It hit a piece of metal, fired accidentally, striking John in the head. A firearms reconstruction expert looked at the report and came to the same conclusion. So Dr. Vega took this information and decided to change John's manner of death from homicide to accidental. And since it was now considered an accident, police no longer had to look into it. And maybe it was just a simple accident, but I find it hard to believe. Changing John's death to accidental ended the investigation, so I think it should have been changed to undetermined, so at least police would still investigate it. As of November 2022, no one has been arrested in connection with the death of John Wells. So now that we've seen, in my personal opinion, Dr. Vega's error in the John Wells case, let's see how he does in the case of Patrick Mullins. Uh, Patrick's remains were partially decomposed, which Dr. Vega stated was consistent with being in the water for about eight or nine days. However, his body was in remarkable condition and showed no signs of being touched by any aquatic wildlife. Patrick's body was weighed down by a 25-pound anchor tied to a three-quarter inch rope, which was wrapped both vertically and horizontally around the body. In Patrick's right back pocket was his wallet, which contained his ID and eight $1 bills. It was noted that Patrick's jeans had sand on them and some sort of blue fiber or string. There was also a small pink mark on Patrick's right middle finger. Due to the extensive damage, Patrick's skull was sent to a forensic anthropologist at the University of Florida. The report noted nine traumatic defects to the skull, including uh, eight in the cranium and one in the mandible or jawbone. These defects are characteristics of a shotgun wound pattern. The largest defect measures about one inch wide. Uh, the others are about 0.4 inches to about half an inch wide. The trajectory is left is right to left with the pellets passing through the right cheek and exiting the left side of the head. Two teeth were missing. It's believed that that occurred post-mortem. The report also noted, quote, additional entrance and exit wounds and additional trauma cannot be ruled out due to the fragmentary condition of the cranium and the missing elements. Those missing elements were pieces of the skull that were never found with the body. Based on the pattern of injury and forensic anthropologist's report, Dr. Vega determined that Patrick was killed by a buckshot shell, which contained eight to ten marble-sized pellets. At first, Dr. Vega seemed that he was going to rule Patrick's death a suicide, as that is what investigators were convinced right from the beginning. And on April 12th, a detective documented that Dr. Vega's findings indicated that Patrick's death 
was not likely a homicide. But when the autopsy results were finalized June 21st, Dr. Vega listed Patrick's manner of death as undetermined. I'm very curious about this whole thing because it feels to me again like it's like I'm hearing the cracks of this case already. It feels again like something is not being answered. Something is not coming up. It feels like this is not what we think it is. Is it ever? Yeah, that's kind of what we do. That's kind of what we do here. So let's take a quick break. We'll have another drink. We'll get to the can and we'll come back with more on the Unsolved Mysteries episode called Body in the Bay on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. The next clap on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We are, of course, discussing the Unsolved Mysteries episode Body in the Bay before the break. Christy was giving us so much information. Uh, What's the next detail? Well, you, I guess I can't say usually because the cases are all so different. Of course. The, we left off with the uh, medical examiner. There we go. Wow. Not a great, not a great start lady. No, I'm Um, with you. The medical examiner listed the death as undetermined. Basically we know it's either going to be suicide or it's going to be homicide. Right. I know it wasn't natural. So, you know, um, we also know it wasn't an accident. So I just want to make sure before we decide one way or the other, uh, I want to give us as much information as possible, which leads me to the private investigator that Jill Mullins hired after the police investigation seemed to go nowhere. Unfortunately, I don't know the name of the investigator, but fortunately, I've read through many of their reports. I love this. Of course you have. Some highlights from the reports. Regarding the location where the victim's body was recovered on February 5th, 2013. According to the PI, the first documented search of the water where Patrick's body was found didn't happen until April 19th, which is 74 days after Patrick was found. And not only that, but the search was conducted as a training exercise. During this search, neither Patrick's missing shoe nor the shotgun used to kill him were found. Uh, The PI then handed, uh, handed, hired, a certified recovery diver who holds two certifications in cave diving um, to search the area for them. Uh, They went out April 22nd, so very close uh, after, uh, and reported that the bottom was a mixture of grassy and sandy patches. Grass was about six to eight inches tall. So the diver searched using a standard search and rescue grid known as mowing the lawn, which I love you know, zigzag back and forth like pattern. Uh, They covered 22,500 square yards. We do not know what the parameters were for the training exercise. Uh, The diver started at 9.45 a.m., ended at 1.15 p.m. They found no man-made items or debris in that field. But if anything had been there 74 days earlier, Is it possible it was swept away with a current? I don't know. I just can't believe they did not search that water right away. Yeah. Uh, While looking into Patrick's case, the private investigator also noted an incident involving guns and boats in Bay County, Florida in August 2015. According to their notes, they did a background search on the suspects involved, but didn't find a connection between them and Patrick or even to the suspects and the area of Bradenton. Bay County is approximately 374 miles or 665 kilometers northwest of Bradenton by car. Both are along the same coast, so it's possible for someone to travel by boat from one to the other. The case doesn't seem connected to Patrick Mullins in any way. The investigator didn't name names or get specific about it, but I'm assuming that they're referring to this case that I've conveniently mentioned here in a 
Side note. Yes, please. No name, just basic. Doesn't so, need it. August 7th, 2015, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Officer David Brady was returning from a call of a runaway pontoon boat on rough waters when he got called to a disturbance involving two men aboard a sailboat. David pulled the men over, tied up their boat, and requested their IDs. David turned back towards his boat to get his notepad, and when he turned back to face them, 20-year-old Samuel Rieger shoved a gun in David's face. Rieger shot David once in the shoulder and once in the side before David jumped into the water. David returned fire at his attacker while treading water, hitting Rieger in the hand. Rieger and his accomplice, 22-year-old Lachlan Atkins, hopped onto David's patrol boat and tried to run David over before speeding away. They headed to the Cove neighborhood uh, in Panama City, where they hid inside a garage for an hour before police closed in on them. The garage, um, inside the garage, police found a nine millimeter pistol that had Rieger's blood on the grip and his DNA on the trigger. A spent shell casing matching that nine millimeter was found on David's boat and a second was found on the suspect's sailboat. Rieger's blood was also on the throttle of David's boat. Thankfully, David Brady did survive Akins was faced with an accessory charge, but he agreed to a plea deal where he would get five years probation in exchange for testimony against Rieger, who was convicted of first degree attempted murder of a law enforcement officer in February 2018 and sentenced to life in prison plus an additional 40 years. But back to Patrick Mullins. Something else that the private investigator hit on that I'd like to mention are the missteps that occurred during the Manatee County Sheriff's Office investigation. I'm going to list most of them in point form because there's not a lot of information surrounding them. So that's where we're at. Yeah. The hat and sunglasses that were found on Patrick's boat were collected as evidence, but never processed or tested in any way. The boat was not videotaped before or after it was processed. And it is a usual thing to go through a crime scene with a camera to record everything. Yeah. Uh, no fingerprints or DNA swabs were taken from inside the boat. Yeah. According to the police reports, when the boat was found, two water bottles were listed on the boat's inventory. However, in photos of the boat's of the boat only one water bottle is shown and it wasn't collected or tested in any way while the boat was being processed by the police it was stored outside in an unsecure location wonderful police didn't interview patrick's brother until june 10th which is 134 days after patrick was reported missing the brother, who I believe was Gray Mullins, spent time with Patrick the night before his disappearance. So you'd think he'd be someone that they'd want to talk to. Uh, during the interview, Gray told police that Patrick was looking forward to retirement and that he didn't appear to be troubled. There is a CSX train bridge approximately 2.3 miles or 3.7 kilometers west of the mouth of the Braden River. It empties into uh, the Manatee River. Any boats in that area would likely pass under it, and the bridge conveniently has cameras. But according to Coast Guard logs, the police said that an officer was on the way to the bridge to collect that camera footage. However, no officer arrived. According to Jill Mullins, a detective told her they needed a search warrant to obtain bridge footage, but he had no probable cause to get the search warrant, which your your husband went missing in that area in a boat. It's, it's probable yeah. cause. Uh, but according to the private investigator, there was an email from a CSX supervisor to that very detective, and the CSX employee seemed pretty eager to give the detective the footage he was requesting. There are emails and reports that show the detective did request the video, but the detective did.
didn't go to the bridge to actually view the video or interview the bridge tender. The detective did review security camera footage from the Manatee Memorial Hospital, as well as other marinas in the area, but for some reason, not that CSX bridge. But it's interesting the detective would claim he had no probable cause to get the footage when that very detective used a search warrant claiming that they were investigating a crime of manslaughter to seize Patrick's computer from his employer. So if you think that the case is potentially manslaughter, then why wouldn't you want to check out the bridge footage to see if Patrick's boat was ever there? And I'm honestly confused by all of it because it was stated on the Unsolved Mysteries episode and in police reports that police went to the CSX Railroad Bridge at Regatta Point on January 29th at 7.56 a.m. to look at video. However, it was stated there was a camera, but that it doesn't record. I also find it strange that it was listed as Regatta Point, which doesn't appear to be the name or location of that bridge. I just don't get any of it. It's all very confusing. But moving on. The private investigator uh, said that the most useful information that the police obtained about Patrick's movements on the day he went missing came because Jill Mullins pushed for it. And the idea that someone has to push the police to actually investigate a potential murder is so depressing to me. Uh, in the end, the private investigator's final report said, and I quote, after reviewing over 400 pages of police reports, medical examiner's reports, conducting my own research and interviewing seven subject matter experts, there is no clearly defined unanimous opinion as to whether or not Patrick Mullins died by his own hand or whether he was the victim of a criminal homicide. So the investigator feels it can't be determined one way or the other, despite their expertise. So obviously it's going to be hard for the chuckleheads to decide, right? Of course. And remember, Dr. Vega concluded that Patrick died from a shotgun blast to the head delivered at close range. Right. And while he was unwilling to outright state that Patrick's death was a suicide, Dr. Vega did say it was possible the shot was self-inflicted, but it's also possible that Patrick was murdered. So we are going to look at the facts of the case to decide for ourselves. Now, is it possible he took his own life? In the grand scheme of anything is possible, yes. Patrick was looking forward to the future his uh, 30th wedding anniversary was coming up in a few months. He wanted so badly to someday be a grandfather. Patrick was also planning on retiring soon and going into business with one of his brothers. But as we know, when it comes to suicide, we don't know what's going on in someone's mind, so we can't eliminate the possibility entirely. Patrick didn't leave a note, and typically it is believed that leaving a note is the indicator whether or not it was a suicide. But according to NPR, only about a third of people who take their own lives leave a note. So based on that and the lack of a note, it doesn't favor lean one way or the other. But a pathologist did complete a psychological autopsy and stated that Patrick Mullins was not a likely candidate for suicide. Something worth noting is that Patrick did have a life insurance policy through Trustmark Insurance Company. He got the policy in January 1993, so it wasn't recent by any means. The policy was for $30,000, and there was no ban on payment in the case of suicide. Usually in the case where a person takes their own life so their family can get the insurance money, uh, the family's going through a hard time financially, that did not appear to be the case in uh, for the Mullins family. But there are some things that stick out to me in regards to suicide. The rope. Dr. Vega said that while it was unusual, it was entirely possible that someone, quote, could have applied the anchor to oneself in a reasonable fashion. However, according to a former law enforcement professional, the ropes were layered neatly which would seem difficult to do if the victim was either sitting or standing in that small boat. 
The wrapping of the ropes feels too organized for someone who may have been going through a mental health crisis at the time. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it looks more like someone wrapped the rope around Patrick as opposed to Patrick wrapping it around himself. Right. Patrick's family believes that if Patrick were to take his own life, that he would have simply secured the rope with a single knot as opposed to using the multiple knots, which the family referred to as amateurish. Also, if someone decided to tie themselves to an anchor, why would they do so where the water wasn't deep enough to conceal the body? And in that area, the water is so clear that he would have been able to see how deep the water was. One of the reasons uh, that the police believe that Patrick's death was a suicide was because his hands weren't tied up uh, in the rope. But if Patrick was forced to tie himself up at gunpoint, maybe, or what if he was tied up after he was killed? Which leads me to the other thing that stands out for me as to why it's probably not a suicide. The sand. When Patrick's body was found in the water, he was covered in sand. And while it could have come from the bottom of the water, I wonder if it's possible that Patrick was taken to land somewhere where he was shot in a separate location before being transferred to the water by another boat. There was not a single speck of blood on Patrick's boat, which makes it hard to believe that Patrick was anywhere near that boat when he got shot. And maybe he was tied to the anchor and thrown overboard and the killer shot Patrick while he was in the water. That could explain maybe why there was no sign of blood. However, if that version of events is true, there would have been a lot of blood in the water, which you think would attract a lot of underwater creatures and scavengers. And based on the autopsy, Patrick's body did not seem to be touched by animals at all, as it was considered to be in remarkable condition. And the Tampa Bay area is said to be one of the most shark-dense bodies of water on Earth. So is it possible that Patrick was killed somewhere else and then put in the water at another location at a later date, maybe? Which brings me to my third, I don't believe it's a suicide point, the gun. Patrick never owned a gun. Based on interviews with gun shop owners in the area and a look into Patrick's financials, it doesn't appear as though he ever purchased a gun. Jill confirmed to detectives that Patrick didn't own a firearm of any kind. The police, as well as an investigative journalist, spoke to every gun dealer in the area. None had ever sold him a shotgun or any ammunition. A forensic audit of his bank account failed to show him ever withdrawing money to buy a shotgun. So where did the gun come from? Well, the Suncoast Gun Show was at the Bradenton Area Convention Center in Palmetto over the weekend of January 26th and 27th. It's located about seven miles or 11 kilometers from where Patrick's body was found. Is it possible that Patrick or the killer bought the gun from that show. But if Patrick did buy a gun at the show, the medical examiner, Dr. Russell Vega, stated that most suicides involve, involving guns cause stippling near the wound, as well as contact wounds where the burning gunpowder leaves residue on the body. However, in this case, there was neither. But we know the gun was held at close range, just not touching the skin, which is probably not an easy thing to do with a big shotgun. In fact, forensic expert Dr. Lori Baker tried to replicate those very circumstances as shown on the Unsolved Mysteries episode. Dr. Baker concluded that it was theoretically possible for someone to shoot themselves at that specific trajectory. It would be incredibly awkward, but it was doable. And maybe that awkward position is proof that the gun was being handled by someone inexperienced such as Patrick. And if Patrick used the gun himself, which is unlikely as there was no evidence that he'd ever handled a shotgun before, then where'd the gun go? Why was it not found at the bottom of the river? How is it not possible that he didn't get 
get a single speck of blood on that boat if he was allegedly sitting on the edge of it so that he would fall back into the water. Both Dr. Vega and Dr. Baker agree that if Patrick died on that boat, quote, it would be almost impossible to not get blood on the boat. And while I'm not saying we can 100% take suicide off the table, I find it hard to believe it just seems as though the investigation was done from the perspective that it was a suicide as opposed to a potential murder, which I believe seriously damaged the entire investigation. To quote that private investigator, a bias is like a virus and can run through the investigative team like the flu. And it's true. If you look into something with a preconceived notion that you're going to look at evidence through a specific lens, which could mean potentially missing crucial pieces of information. But if we think that suicide was not the manner of death in this case, that leaves us with homicide. And Patrick Mullins was a seemingly happily married high school librarian. One small thing that may be insignificant that I'm going to mention is the private investigator learned that on February 21st, 2012, a year before Patrick's death, the Manatee County Sheriff's Office ran a criminal history check on Patrick Mullins. The reason is unknown. I assume it wasn't work-related as he had been in the same job for several years. Is it possible they searched the wrong name? Maybe? I don't know. I don't know how many Patrick Mullins are in the area. Um, but it's just a random thing. Could mean nothing. Uh, but if we're going to look at this case from the angle of suicide, or homicide rather, who would want Patrick Mullins dead? Well, there is a lot of drug trafficking that happens in that area. So is it possible that Patrick saw something he wasn't meant to, or that he was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time? Maybe he saw a drug deal go down. Maybe he found something he shouldn't have and someone else tried to take it from him. According to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, between 2012 and 2013, the amount of cocaine that was brought into Florida increased by 483%. Wow. And in 2013, officers seized nearly 13,000 pounds of cocaine and 27,000 pounds of cannabis, which was double the numbers from the year before. And with a, there was a lot of fighting at the time going on amongst the drug cartels who were bringing in those very drugs. So it meant that the fighting caused them to move their smuggling routes which somehow led to millions of dollars worth of drugs ending up in the ocean and being abandoned. I don't know if this means boats went down or if people ditched the drugs overboard because they saw police or what, but it turns out a lot of drugs wash up on the beaches of Florida. Just a few quick examples. In 2013, officers collected a total of 55 pounds of cocaine that washed up in St. John's County. In 2014, 112 pounds of marijuana and 77 pounds of cocaine were found. And in March 2016, a couple walking on a beach in Martin County found 44 pounds of cocaine, a street value of over $2 million. In April 2021, $1.5 million worth of cocaine was found in, on the shores of Palm Beach. And in December that same year, someone walking on the beach found a $1 million worth of cocaine in the Keys. August 2022, 70 pounds of cocaine were found floating in the Florida Keys. And while this is a lot of drugs, what about specific drugs in Manatee County, not the entire state of Florida? Well, in 2015, Manatee County had more heroin overdoses than any other county in the state of Florida. So while we're on the topic of drugs in Manatee County, and to add even more true crime to our already true crime story, I present to you some instances of drug activity in the county and the area. Keep in mind, I am not suggesting 
that any of these specific people were involved in Patrick's death. I'm just using them as examples to show the type of drug activity in the area and that it's possible Patrick was a witness to something that cost him his life. Right. Uh, police were called to a Holiday Inn Express in Bradenton in July 2011 after the staff found a fully loaded 45 caliber pistol and what appeared to be cocaine in a room. Based on what was found, police were able to get a search warrant for the room's previous occupant, 27-year-old Michael Renard Albury Jr., who had switched to another room. So they get they execute the search warrant. They discover more than half a kilo of cocaine, 600 tablets of BCP, a firearm, and approximately $15,000 cash. Albury was arrested and charged with two counts of possession with intent to distribute possession of firearms, and being a convicted felon in possession of a firearm. He was found guilty in May 2012 and sentenced to 60 years in prison, which is wild. And I mean, we it's we don't have time to get into that, but the amount of like murders we see and they don't even get 10 years, you know, anyhow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in September 2013, 25-year-old Brett Matson of Bradenton and 35-year-old Sheridan Co. of California were arrested after being caught by drug-sniffing dogs at the Sarasota Bradenton International Airport. The dog sniffed 20 pieces of luggage but for focused on four suitcases which belonged to Matson and Co. All four bags were filled with books which were filled with 56 vacuum-sealed bags of marijuana totaling 63 pounds. Sadly, I could not find what happened to those two gentlemen after that. <laughs> then in June 2016, 43-year-old Jarvis Roderick Thomas was pulled over by police and found to have a suspended license. While pulled over, Thomas quietly threw a black bag out of the window of his car. Someone found the bag, contacted the police. Um, inside were 20 small bags of 69 grams of meth and 45 bags of 3.8 grams of heroin. A security camera at a nearby Walgreens recorded Thomas throwing the bag out of his car window during that traffic stop. Police learned that Thomas uh, might be storing narcotics in his home in Bradenton, and after executing a search warrant, Officers found more than 1,000 grams of methamphetamine, 29 grams of heroin, a loaded 25 caliber Beretta handgun, and almost $24,000 in cash. He pleaded guilty in 2017 and was later sentenced to 17 years and six months. Then we've got 41-year-old Robert Tito Reyes was arrested in July 2016 after a year-long investigation that led police to seizing $400,000 in cash, 33 guns, and more than $700,000 worth of drugs. It turns out that Reyes was a bit of a kingpin, and his operation was spread out over multiple addresses in Bradenton, including the auto shop that he owned. It was also discovered at the time of his arrest that he had been operating in Bradenton for 25 years. Wow. Reyes worked with very few people, and the ones he did work with were his family members. So his wife, Elizabeth Reyes, was also arrested for trafficking narcotics, and his sister, Olga Reyes, was arrested for the same. Uh, Reyes took a plea deal in December 2018 and was sentenced to 25 years. The Manatee County Sheriff's Office and the DEA worked together in November 2016 to target multiple drug trafficking organizations in a task force that they called Operation Hot Batch. <laughs> and I, I just want the job. Let me have the police computer for just a few minutes. But while I'm there, I want to be in the room when you're naming these. Of just, course. I would like to put out some suggestions. And I would like to write down the ones you don't use. Like, I just, just a couple things. But as a result, 34 people ranging in age from 22 to 46 were arrested and charged with distribution, possession, and conspiracy. Most of the accused were from Palmetto or Bradenton. 
They were all charged in December 2017, and their sentences ranged from 18 months to 30 years. I just felt like there was no need to get into 34 separate people, but yeah. that gave us the bare bones of that. Yeah. Uh, then we have October 2018. Police arrested 44-year-old Jennifer Lambert for sale and distribution of methamphetamine in Nokomis, which is about 29 miles or 46 kilometers south of Bradenton. When looking through her record, police noted that Lambert had numerous trafficking charges dating back over a decade and that she'd been involved in seven drug transactions over the course of eight months. Police decided to start a sting operation to try and take down her entire network. The network referred to Lambert as Mama Jen, which is so Mama Nugs. Yep. But not. Uh, so officers went undercover in what they dubbed Operation Ice Mama. You, you can't make these up. You uh, can't. In, well, but the joke is they do. Uh, in June 2022, they were able to arrest all 16 people involved in Lambert's network. All 16 pleaded guilty. Their sentences ranged from 90 days to 10 years in prison. Lambert specifically was sentenced to 10 years in prison plus another five years probation. And just to give you an idea as to the history of the people in this network, between the 16 of them, there were 156 prior felony charges with 49 convictions and 149 prior misdemeanor charges and 72 convictions. So they had experience, I guess. Yeah, 100%. Um, in August 2022, police seized packages belonging to 33-year-old postal worker Natasha Prieto. It turns out the packages contained cocaine and that Prieto had picked, would pick random addresses from her route as a postal worker and she'd give them to her accomplice, 37-year-old Angel Hernandez Cross. Cross would then arrange for packages of cocaine to be sent from Puerto Rico to the addresses that Prieto provided. And then once the packages got to the post office, Prieto would intercept them, pass them on to Cross, who would then open them and sell the drugs from them. Both were charged with conspiring to distribute and possess with the intent to distribute more than five or more kilograms of cocaine, if convicted, they face a mandatory minimum term of 10 years. And my final story for you involves 43-year-old Gabino Peralta Sosito, nicknamed The Pony and The Friend. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which yeah, gives another... It just give both of those names kind of give a specific tone that I don't yeah. feel this gentleman maybe had. Um, Peralta Sacito was one of Mexico's largest drug lords who worked with some of the most violent cartels in the world, including, and my apologies for this pronunciation, Los Cabo Caballeros, Templarios, and La Familia Mi. Mio Kenya, which were also known as the family, who were known to be particularly violent, such as the time that the family threw five severed heads onto the dance floor of a crowded nightclub. Uh, the heads came with a message that said, quote, the family doesn't kill for money. It doesn't kill women. It doesn't kill innocent people. Only those who deserve to die know that this is divine justice. Well, wow. and know that this is terrifying to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of these cartels, Peralta Cecito smuggled drugs from Mexico into Florida from 2001 to 2011. It is estimated that his operation, which included distribution throughout Manatee County, was more worth more than $300 million. Over the decade, it is believed he was responsible for smuggling and selling a minimum of 12,000 kilos of cocaine. Peralta Sacido was arrested in Mexico in 2016 and extradited to the United States. 
at the time of his arrest, he was wanted in 180 countries. And may I remind you, there are only 195 <laughs> in the world. So Great point. You know, point. just, you know, educating all over the place. Uh, Peralta Sacita pleaded guilty in December 2018 to conspiracy to distribute cocaine and heroin. He took a plea deal and was sentenced to 24 years and four months. So again, I'm not saying any of these specific drug dealers were involved, but to me, these stories prove that it's more than possible that Patrick could have come across something or someone that he shouldn't have. Maybe Patrick witnessed a crime or maybe a criminal's boat ran out of gas or broke down and Patrick was just being a good Samaritan. And maybe the person pulled a gun on him and either tied him up or forced Patrick to tie himself up and they took the boat to another location. A witness said they saw one person driving Patrick's boat with the top up around 6 p.m. The witness was not close enough to get a description of the driver, but is it possible the suspect was driving while Patrick was tied up lying in the bottom of the boat? Maybe it's not deep enough for that, but yeah. if, if the witness was too far to get a description, maybe they just were too far to notice if someone was lying down, and also maybe they just weren't looking for it. Yeah. Or maybe it wasn't just a random criminal. Maybe the suspect was someone that Patrick knew personally. Which leads me to Damon Crestwood. Damon was a chef and former restaurant owner who was friends with Patrick's brother, Gray Mullins, since the late 80s, early 90s. Damon and Gray were close enough that Damon and his family were often invited to holidays, such as like Memorial Day parties. But to be clear, Damon and Patrick were not close, and from what I can tell, didn't spend any time alone together. Due to the two of them not being close, Patrick's family feels that Damon's reaction to Patrick's death was incredibly suspicious. When Patrick first went missing, Gray said that Damon would, quote, break into tears and then uncontrollable sobbing any time Patrick was mentioned. And later, Damon told Jill that he would go and look out on Manatee River and cry and sob for hours just thinking about Patrick, which again is not exactly behavior you would expect from an acquaintance. No. Then when Patrick's body was found, Damon started asking friends if they would still be his friend and be there for him, quote, if something happened. But he never elaborated further on that. Then things got more suspicious. At a family gathering on Memorial Day in 2013, Patrick's son Miles said he saw Damon tie a rope to his dog and then tie the other end of the rope around himself in the exact same way the rope was tied around his father's body. Every year uh, on the anniversary of Patrick's death, Damon would have a complete mental breakdown which feels like intense guilt to me, although I am yeah. no expert. But in my non-expert opinion, it feels like Damon was doing something maybe less than legal that day. Patrick saw him and either Damon or someone he was with killed Patrick to cover their tracks. Having a breakdown every year on the anniversary of the death of someone you barely knew feels very telling. And who knows, maybe Damon was just a highly sensitive person he maybe had other things going on and it wasn't really connected to him. Maybe it reminded him of his own mortality. I don't know. It still feels um, suspicious. But also, in the realm of suspicious, there's the fact that red paint markings were found on the side of Patrick's boat. It is believed that they occurred sometime after Patrick went missing. And Damon happened to own a red striped boat which was kept docked off the Manatee River near the mouth of Tampa Bay, not far from where Patrick's body was found. But the most suspicious part to me is that when police approached Damon and asked to take a paint sample to test against the paint found on Patrick's boat, Damon refused. And to that I say, what happened to the man who was so distraught over Patrick's death that he has yearly breakdowns? 
Wouldn't that person want Patrick's death investigated as much as possible? To me, the only reason that Damon said no was because he knew it would implicate him because he knows more than he's admitting to. Friends say that soon after Patrick's death, Damon started using crystal meth. Was he casually using before and no one knew, and it just got worse after Patrick's death, or did the problem start after Patrick's death? I don't know. But they said that Damon became increasingly impulsive and paranoid, and on April 5th, 2017, Damon died from an overdose. He was 48 years old. He was described as pleasant and a sweetheart who, prior to 2013, was known to be honest and respectable. After Damon's death, his daughter was given ownership of the red striped boat, and she allowed the police to take a sample for comparison, and it was found to be a perfect match to the paint markings on Patrick's boat. However, police said the paint was common enough that it couldn't be conclusively used as evidence that Damon's boat had come into contact with Patrick's boat. Also something I want to point out, the buoys in the Egmont Channel where the boat was found are also painted red. So is it possible the red markings came from one of those buoys? To the best of my knowledge, the paint from the buoys was never compared to the paint markings on Patrick's boat. But if Damon was involved in Patrick's death, what was his motive? Did Damon see someone attack Patrick and maybe the killer threatened to harm Damon if he went to the cops? Or did Damon's problem with crystal meth start earlier than people realize and maybe Patrick came across Damon either buying drugs or helping to traffic them into the area? Is it possible that Patrick was out testing the motor? noticed Damon's boat, but when he got closer, he found a drug deal going down and the suspect panicked and took Patrick hostage. Did police ever look into whether or not Damon has ever purchased any shotguns or whether he had any experience with guns? Did police look into Damon's financials? The questions just don't stop. But even with so many questions surrounding Patrick's death, his family continues to search for answers the family is currently offering a $20,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest or conviction in connection to Patrick's case. Jill said, quote, we'll continue pursuing this until there's an answer. That's a part of life, but that's not all of life. And one source stated that Jill Mullins was engaged to a man named Mike, who is supportive of Jill and her continued efforts to fight for justice for Patrick. And while the Mullins family is very private, so I couldn't confirm whether or not this mic exists, but honestly, God, I hope it's true. I hope that Jill has found love again, and I hope that whoever he is, is a lovely, supportive person. Because based on the current state of Patrick's case, I just don't know how it can ever get solved with no witnesses to the crime, or at least none that have come forward. We won't have a chance to truly know what happened to Patrick Mullins. And while his case remains open, investigators are struggling to find time to look into cold cases such as Patrick's. Um, a detective who works in the homicide unit at Manatee County Sheriff's Office, she took over Patrick's, Patrick's case in March 2016. And she said she only gets a chance to look at it whenever there's downtime in the homicide unit because they have to, of course, look at the newer cases that are happening, she said, quote, I have five detectives. All of them are assigned different cold cases to work, depending on leads and information. Each is assigned about two to four cases to keep track of. And I can't imagine having a lot of time to do that. Um, the private investigator that Jill hired said, quote, there is no surplus of investigative man hours to be spread out over current death investigations and those termed cold cases. Any agency has to make the most of those hours and provide their death investigators the best in training and supervision that they can. And sadly, with the uh, number of new cases that each investigator gets, it doesn't leave them the time to devote to the cold cases, which is sad to think that justice won't be served. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm Christy Oxborough.
Oh my gosh, what a wild ride. Well, listen, um, let's take one more break, have another drink, hit the cam one more time, and then we'll be back with our final thoughts on this Unsolved Mysteries Body in the Bay episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, third clap. Here we go on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, talking the Unsolved Mysteries episode, Body in the Bay. My goodness, I'm going to be honest. Um, it's, uh, there's, there's, it feels like, first of all, kudos to you, Christy Oxborough, for building such a in-depth episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Um, because as I'm like going through my notes, I was going through my notes on the break. It just feels like, you know, there's a lot of holes here. Yeah. And we love to poke holes in general on this show. It's what we try to do. But, I mean, again, it's 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 tough because I'm looking at these, I'm looking at my notes. I'm looking at these different things that I wrote. I'm looking at the things that you told us about. And again, it's like, you know, the one thing that did come to mind was you talked about the CSX train bridge. Yeah. And that made me immediately trigger to the Sarah Jones episode of the show. Yeah. Because we know that that CSX, that was a whole thing. There was a huge debate about what they had agreed to, what they hadn't, all of the above. So that was something that was interesting for me. First of all, just because it was reminiscent of another episode that we had done. Sure. But then also, you know, it's always interesting when you're hearing about an organization that perhaps was questionable in the past. And now you're hearing about them in another context where it's like, oh, maybe they're questionable again. You know, so that was interesting to me. The fact that that came up. Um, the idea that someone could have killed themselves with rope. Okay. Okay. I mean, again, we can get into all of it, but to me, it's it's like, ultimately, was he tied after he was killed? These are the kinds of questions. I think for me, it's just, this whole thing, There's there's so many question marks, and there's so, look, I'm just going to come out and say it. Sure. This round of Unsolved Mysteries has been tough. The first season of the new Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix, we were delighted by. It was yes. a joy to dig into. Season two, maybe not the same fervor that we had for season one, but still it was like there's lots to dig into. This season, it's been hard. I feel like these cases, it's like we're being given such a small amount of information. And you're coming up with amazing stuff. But at the end of the day, it just feels like, I don't know. The Overall, cases, yeah, the cases that they chose this season definitely are ones where there is not a lot out not. there about them. So it's, it's tough to, yeah, it's tough to make something out of nothing like if there's no, only so much information and keep in mind they uh, they put out a 40 ish to 50 minute episode yeah and a lot of it is stuff getting repeated and a lot of that and it's like if it it would be a much shorter episode if it was just that info like here's just the information we have and then that's it yeah um and so to find something to do closer to the size of the episode that we do on each of these cases is tough yeah it's tough and look uh i was gonna say it at some point publicly and i'll say it now because i know a lot of people have said that they really really loved this season of or course. this volume sure. however we're putting it um of unsolved mysteries um i had even written a thing i'm not gonna read it specifically i'm just going to give us the uh, bare bones of it. But please, when we first 
were in very excited. We were just, I don't know, titillated doesn't seem like the right word, but it seems like a funny word. Of course. Um, we were very excited about this volume of Unsolved Mysteries. Yes. Um, not jazzed that they came out three separate weeks. That we, yeah. we, We've yep. got them all now. We've seen them all. Um, we had said prior to it coming out, we're going to cover each episode. It's going to be a thing. Um, after having seen all of them now, yeah, um, we have decided... Uh, I say we, that's, uh, I personally have decided, and Lauren has beautifully uh, chosen to back me on this. Of course. Um, that there are two episodes, at least, I probably just the two, uh, that we aren't going to touch. Yeah. And I know that people are going to be disappointed, um, but I will specifically say um, one of them is the abducted by a parent episode um i i will happily share all of the photos on our socials to try and raise awareness and that sort of thing um but if the fbi doesn't know the new name of the the parents or children and has no idea where they are i am not going to come close to being able to find them which means there, there isn't very much, there isn't enough for an episode. Um, and it's also like a really tough one to deal with. Um, I think if, I think we felt like we had to do all of them before. And I think if we had gone into it where we weren't a brand new show, I think we would have gone, not the ones with the kids. You know, I think we would have yeah. maybe stayed away from those um, back then. Uh, but then pajama pants bailiff never would have been born true out of uh discomfort true. but um the other one we're not going to do and again i know people really liked it and i know it's going to be disappointing to hear but the ghost in apartment 14 yep and i know some people haven't seen it uh so i hope this is not considered a spoiler in any way but i am not opposed to any sort of doing a ghost or a paranormal whatever sort of episode in fact spoiler alert i'm actually looking into one that'll come out probably january so there's that but for me a very very small part of that episode was about a ghost and all of that and the ghost that they believed was um the person who was the ghost in the episode um was also involved in a case that was so, so graphic and brutal that I, I, you can't do that episode without bringing up that case. And to me, that case uh, specifically is solved. And I know people prefer the unsolved ones when we do them, but to me, there's just not enough. Uh, why uh, it just feels like nobody's going to want to hear that brutal content. And I know some people are going to, say that all stories should be told and i agree but we we get a lot of messages from people who feel like sometimes our content is too far for them especially cases that involve children where they're like we don't want to uh, we're uncomfortable hearing this and we get that and in this case i think the particular case of the woman um who had some pretty horrific things happen to her I just feel like mentioning that is more harmful than good. So, and I know that I can't bring up that episode without bringing up that case. So I have made the choice. If you want to be disappointed or angry at anybody uh, directed at me, because I made the choice of, I just don't feel like this is what people are going to want to hear. And I don't feel like it's what I personally want to spend a week very deep in but i promise you will get a paranormal case i promise you will get other stuff that you're gonna love and just uh know that we are not leaving out a case because we don't feel that it's important we are just leaving them out sometimes for the sake of personal preference 
Yeah. And I think that that's an important uh, note to make because uh, at the end of the day, here's the deal. If we have learned anything over the past two years, yeah, it's that there is absolutely no pleasing everybody. Any choice that we make is going to delight some and enrage others. Yes. It's going to make some happy and disappoint others. There is truly no way to try to please everybody. And I think that there has been times, and I'll speak for myself in this, on this amazing journey we've been on, that I've tried and, and we've tried to try and crack the nut of like, what are the universally accepted, whatever you, however you want to label it, what are, what are the universal cases? Sure. And they don't exist. No. And what we've learned is that if we try and do things that we don't really resonate with to please others, some people hate it. If we try to only do things that we like, some people hate it and vice versa. And so I think that it's important to remember that if you listen to this show and that you, and you like this show, um, we choose what we talk about or or we we have to an extent and, and are going to further choose what we talk about thoughtfully. And there will be a reason why we've chosen it. And we may not get into detail about why we've chosen it, but there will be a reason why we did. And if there's a reason we're not covering it, there's a reason why we did. And that can resonate with you or not. And that's your prerogative. But our prerogative at the end of the day is that you can't please everybody. Yeah. You can't even try. No. Um, you can't even only try to please yourselves. There's there's just no winning uh, ultimately. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think making the decisions that feel the most authentic to ourselves that feel like they're rooted in being the best choices for ourselves. That's the only thing we can do. And again, when we when we came into season three of Unsolved Mysteries, we were so excited and it was, this is so great. We're going back to our roots. And it's just not been what we want it to be. And we had a choice where it was like, we can we can continue doing this the way we have and cover them, whether it resonates with us or not. Or we can say, you know what? This isn't really feeling great. And we're going to yeah. cover stuff that feels a little bit better in whatever, you know, definition that that means to us. Sure. And I think that that's, that's it. At the end of the day, that's it. And we curate based on what feels the best for us, or rather we will move forward curating based on what feels best for us. Um, and that just is what it is. And uh, we hope that you'll stay on board with us. And if you don't, uh, we wish you well. But um, it's just impossible to try and spin the amount of plates that it would require to please everybody. Because you can't. You can't. I mean, prime example, we one of our most requested cases that we've ever done was Jean Benet. Yep. And Madeline McCann. Yep. Those were the some of the most requested right out the gate. And we were very hesitant because I really didn't want to do any that involved with children. But I was like, it's a very popular thing. We can look into it. Sure, people want it. And the amount of people who didn't like the episode said they couldn't finish it because it was so uncomfortable, that sort of thing. And no shade. No shade to the people who wanted it. No shade to the people who didn't. I'm just pointing out it was one of the, like, both were top requested episodes. But both also turned around and had some of the most people who couldn't, didn't want to listen to it and said they're going to skip it. No thanks. Yep. And you, if there are cases you need to skip, understood. I get it. That's kind of the world we kind of live in, in the world of true crime. But... My point is just, it's somehow both the most requested, but also 
the most know it's uncomfortable. Yep. And understood. And yep. so that's just kind of where we're at now, where we're like, you know what? If it's uncomfortable for us, maybe we pass. And that's okay, too. Absolutely. We have, we have grown in so many ways. And so we're kind of all over the place. So there are still some more Unsolved Mysteries from this season that we will do. Yeah. And then we're going to dazzle you with other stuff. Yep. It's just how we do. It's how we do. Yeah. It's how we do. 100%. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's uh, it's all it's all a journey. It's all learning. It's all all of the above. Um, top to bottom uh, in every in every sense, in every way, all of the above. But again, yeah, it's it's at the end of the day. We are still the people that have to. Do the work and put it out. And try and ignore all of the shitty comments and all of the bullshit. We are still the people that have to balance or try to balance our other lives and other work along with this work and inevitably get, you know, shit. Um, and at the end of the day, I think what it comes down to, and I'll speak for myself, is that at the end of the day, I guess for me, I'd rather get shit about stuff that I feel passionately about than stuff that I'm doing because I feel like we have to. Or, or sure. you know, and that's just the truth. And people are going to be mad that that I just said that. People are going to be mad that we've said any of this. We've come to terms with the fact that that there is a contingent that just loves to be mad about whatever we do. And what sure. I say is, thanks for coming back. Thanks for continuing to listen. Yeah. Because you bring so much vitriol and anger and hatred um, that it's interesting that you continue to come back and find new platforms and ways to contact us. It's again, your tenacity is truly admirable and I, I, I admire it. But at the end of the day, we're the people that are left holding the bag. We're the people that live with what the fallout is of the research. We're the people whose lives end up being impacted. And it is what it is. Yeah. And I mean, hey, shout out to the positive yeah. people. We we see so you too. We do. We appreciate that We do, that and we do much. love it. Yes. Very, very much. Yes. But I think it, I think ultimately this, and look, I'll fucking say it. This round of Unsolved Mysteries, I think was was a bit of a letdown. I'll speak for myself. I think it was sure. a bit of a letdown. Ones in the past were so amazing and so interesting. And and this round, it's just felt like hard to 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 dig. And and Christy worked so hard. And and she was like messaging me the other day where she's like, I spent like six hours just trying to find this person's birthday. And she found it. Yeah. I did. She did because she never ceases to to falter. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when it's like, if she's having to spend six hours to find the birthday of a person who's of the main person involved in one of these cases, it's like, how is our research even best being spent? It's a it's a lot. A lot of hours go into this uh, behind the scenes. Because that's the other thing. We put out something that's two, two and a half hours, whatever it is. Um, but we we live in it for a solid like 80 hours leading up to the record. Yeah. And then there's the the time that we put in after it for that same episode. So uh it can be a lot. Yeah, sometimes sometimes there's just not the information that we would hope there would be, but we do the best with what we can find. We do. You know? Yeah. 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 And listen, we appreciate all the people who have been so supportive and wonderful um, from the beginning to now. It's it's amazing. It's, it's why we can continue to do this and want to continue to do this. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, I think it's like, you know, 
to quote some great therapists of our time, at some point you got to set boundaries. Sure. And say, this is what we're doing and this is why. And, uh, you know, you just hope people respect them. Yes. And that's it. And all I'm going to say is unsolved mysteries. How did you not choose Tamla Horsford? And I think that's the other thing that's so frustrating. It's like, look, all of these cases deserve to be talked about. All of the stories deserve to be told. But when we've covered stuff on this show already where it's like, honestly, my hope when this round was coming out, because Christy was like, well, we'll see. Maybe they'll cover some of the cases we already did. And in the back of my mind, I was going, I hope they do. I hope that they do cover a Tamla Horsford, a Kiara Coles, yeah, those cases that are so confounding. And I hope that they give a little bit more for us to then do a part two sure, and build on that. That just feels like such a tangible, um, wonderful use of time. And it's not to, again, it's not to downgrade any cases that they're, they're, they're covering, but it's more just that it's like, when season one had these cases that were just so rich and so yeah. again to that same level where you're like, we're so close. We're right there. We just need some more brains. We need some more time. We need some more, whatever. Yep. It's tough to then go to something where again, you need to spend six hours to even find somebody's birthday. And I only use yeah. that as an example because it's giving context for what we're talking about, where it's like, it's like a needle in a haystack. And look, there's lots of other shows. There's lots of other true crime shows that don't do the research that we do. They just recap what they watched and that's it. And that's great. Sure. No problem. But for what we do and what we've done for this long, two years at this point, we need to choose topics that are at least going to be interesting to us and allow us to feel like we are digging in, scratching the surface, all of the above, and bringing the kind of episodes that not only we have been known for bringing, but also that we like to bring. Yeah. And to be clear, I know, I hear you all. What was the point of the birthday? Was it that important? Well, once I found it, searching with the name did bring up something else that hadn't been brought up before. So yes, but also... I'm a stickler. I like to be able to, I start off the same way and that's just, I like to bring as much information as possible. And when it gets, when I get multiple roadblocks where I can't bring that information, oh, it, it tears me up yeah, inside, you know? But, yeah. And that's the thing is that it's like, you know, if it's that hard to find that about something, yeah. the idea that it would be like, we'll be the ones to crack this one open, it's it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. But we're listen. We're doing our best. We're doing our best. And we, we do appreciate, again, all of you dear listeners, we appreciate your support. We appreciate those that have listened from the beginning. We appreciate those that have found us now. We appreciate all of you. Um, we appreciate the discourse that happens. What we don't appreciate is is uh, anger, is vitriol, is combativeness. And I've said that on this show recently, and people got mad at me for that too, but I stand by it. Yeah. I don't think that we need to be, uh, I think it's our prerogative, as it is anybody's prerogative to say, that we don't welcome um, ugliness. Sure. We welcome discussion. We welcome debate. We don't welcome ugliness. That's never what we've brought it put into the world. And that's just not, that's not what we do. Yes. Um, but we appreciate all of those who see us. We see you too. And we hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. We hope you enjoy next week's episode of the show. If you haven't already, please give us a follow on the socials, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. On Patreon, patreon.com slash True Creme and Cocktails. And of course, the only place for official True Creme and Cocktails merch is truecrewmerch.com. So check that out as well if you're interested. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? 
Well, I know we just said we weren't going to, um, we were just talking about Unsolved Mysteries. Don't fear because we are taking a, a quick veer off to just quick break. something a little different. We will get back to Unsolved Mysteries. But on the next True Crime and Cocktails, Drew Peterson. Ooh, what a case. Tune in for that. You're not going to want to miss it. Trust me. I think I know everything about it. I bet dear Christy is going to teach me some things that I don't know, as she always does. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Dave Grohl. Hey. Good night forever, Chris Evans. 